models that look pretty interesting. Um, this is a job, apparently. You're looking for a remote pen test lead that can be junior to mid-level at CISA, which is a government agency. Um, I've had students get good jobs at government agencies. Um, so check it out. I know I've had some students have great success there, even when they're not very technically advanced. But when they tell other students, a whole bunch of them refuse to work there because you really can't smoke pot. And a lot of my students greatly value smoking pot more than having a job, which is not my idea of the wise priorities. But anyway, check it out if you want to work at CISA. This one's getting a lot of attention. Apparently, it was done through TeamViewer. A remote attacker managed to take over the water system of a city in Florida, and apparently they put lye in the water. A small amount of lye for some reason, I don't know why, but he was able to increase it by a factor of 100. But the operator was able to detect this and return the level to normal, so he did not actually poison any people. But apparently this has happened before. And uh, the first thing, of course, that occurs to me is I don't know why they don't uh, use a more secure system, like a VPN or two-factor authentication or something, and not just TeamViewer. So anyway, this is uh, something that the infrastructure people have been warning us about for years, that um, critical infrastructure is using very old security procedures. and. Uh, you can't really trust it, which is what I've heard about all sorts of things. So uh, I think the heavy industry of power plants and such has been very slow to uh, accept newer security procedures. All right. And this one I thought was very interesting. This is a lawsuit, and a company had a data breach. And the court decided that you could not sue the company for the data breach unless you could prove that you got hacked because of that data breach. And this is uh, similar to cases where you have, if you live next to a power plant and a power plant leaks poison in the water, and then you get cancer. Similarly, company uh, people have found it nearly impossible to sue a power plant because you can't prove that that water pollution caused this cancer. You need to have a, a smoking gun and a bullet from this attacker to this result. And that's why um, the recommendation I've heard from uh, about this is that there's no point trying to prosecute based on individual harm. What you have to do is pass a regulation. And then you can punish them for failure to obey the regulation, which I think that's the point here, too, with, uh, with data breaches. So. I've been very much down on Bitcoin because it's not held up by anything. It's not held up by any government or any bank or anything. But Elon Musk got interested, and now he's bought $1.5 billion of Bitcoin. And if Elon Musk is going to be a big whale holding Bitcoin, then I suppose you could regard Bitcoin as something resembling Tesla stock. And maybe you should take it more seriously because it is being held up by some large entity that values it. And that's what the Bitcoin enthusiasts have been hoping. They've been hoping that they can get mainstream companies to use Bitcoin to where it becomes accepted. And perhaps that's going to happen. Elon Musk might be the start of a lot of big companies moving into Bitcoin and everybody accepting it. And then it would be a sort of more legitimate currency. So we'll see what happens. But it's certainly gone way up. Um, so Malware Bazaar has a list of online malware, and now you can set up your own Yara rules. Yara is a simple tool like grep that looks for patterns in malware, and then it will um, notify you by email, somehow connected to your Twitter account. So that's an interesting issue. I haven't played with this. might be worth looking at in the malware analysis class. Um, Anyway, there are quite a few of these online malware sources um, and online malware analysis tools. So Microsoft um, got sued, as you probably know, 20 years ago by the US government to punish them for integrating a browser into Windows 98 and thus uh, using monopoly power to crush Netscape. And the um, 
result of that was Microsoft nearly got split up and it was only a fortuitous uh, presidential election that saved them. And after that, they asked Bill Gates, what did you learn? And he said, what I learned is you have to donate to political campaigns. And so ever since then, Microsoft has had a policy of donating to both sides, Democrat and Republican, because it's just basically a cost of doing business. You have to pay the bribe so that somebody will pick up the phone when you have a problem. If you don't contribute to their campaigns, then you have no friends in Washington, which is our American bribery system. And um, But about... Three weeks ago, a bunch of Microsoft employees complained and said they should stop donating money to the Republicans who refused to certify Biden's win on the grounds that they're undermining our democracy and that's bad for business and they should take a more ethical stand. And that appears to have succeeded inside Microsoft. They have now decided that they, instead of just donating to any politician on either side who might have some voice in tech regulation, they are going to don't not donate to any of the Republicans that refuse to uh, author to agree to the election results for two years. See a question here, contributing to both sides. Yeah, well, contributing to both sides is the old-fashioned business technique. And um, but at some point, one there are times when one side is is doing something so unpopular that a business cost of uh, donating to that is not worth it. And so, uh, and this, by the way, was well defended today on uh, the Sway podcast, which is very good by Carl Swisher. Uh, Brad Johnson, the um, big Microsoft executive, was there explaining this. And it was really very nice. You know, Microsoft is enjoying having the moral high ground. There's a time 20 years ago when Microsoft was considered the most evil, malicious, abusive tech company, but not really anymore. <clears throat> so anyway, um, they are really going to, at least for two years, not donate to those Republicans who uh, refused to admit that Biden won the election, and we'll see what comes of this. Uh, this is probably one of the forces that has a highest probability of actually getting us through this enormous electoral crisis we're going through, where um, it's where the Republicans are going to deny that Biden won the election and uh, change all the election rules, and there's a whole lot of nasty things going on in, in the presidential and Washington politics. But the large companies may be able to drag them back by denying funds to the people who are tearing down democracy. That seems to be the most powerful control on them. Anyway, um, so there's Space Force. Trump created Space Force, and they didn't have a name for the officers of Space Force, so they threw it off to the internet, and they got tons and tons of silly names, like Skywalkers and Wookiees, there's a whole document here of all the silly names people sent up there. And they settled on um, Guardians, which is like Guardians of the Galaxy. So it's pretty silly all by itself. But anyway, that's the technical term for uh, people who are uh, military, people who are in the Space Force are called Guardians, apparently. And they also have a logo and a badge that looks an awful lot like a Star Trek badge. So... Uh, it is understandable why a lot of people don't take it very seriously yet. But it exists for what it's worth. And so this is an increasingly common problem. There was a very popular Google Play app, Barcode Scanner, and people used it for a couple of years, and then it turned evil and pushed out an update, which would then start popping up ads on your screen. So every product you have on your phone and on your laptop and everything, the person who made it can push down updates, and those can be evil updates at any time. And so it really is, this is the supply chain problem that's getting more and more people worried, especially since the solar winds attack. How many people are you trusting? So are they, yeah, guardians of the, well, that's right. Apparently they're not technically guardians of the galaxy, but their official term is guardians. Anyway, so we're up to the official time, and let me just explain what's going on here. Um, as you probably noticed in the last week, Zoom doesn't work well on my system anymore. So I was motivated to look for an alternative, and Twitch seems to work much better. So I'm going to use Twitch for the lectures because it makes high quality recordings and it lets people see the lectures and share my screen very well. And I have Zoom going now, mostly because a lot of people are still used to using Zoom. And also we might use Zoom for like the office hour part that comes after the lecture when students might want to share your screen. So uh, anyway, to see the lecture, go to Twitch. I've muted the Zoom because otherwise you get echoes. And uh, so let me know if you have any questions or problems, but so far it looks to me like people have found a lecture and we can get on with it. And I'm very glad to have a nice efficient sharing system today because I've got a lot of demos to show you. 
So uh, let me get my slides, which are floating around here somewhere. Um, all right, maybe I got to open them again. This thing. Although I'm really not going to use these slides very much. Here they are. I'm mostly going to demonstrate this stuff live. There we go. The exploit. Okay, Stack Overflows in Linux. So this is the meat of the course. I mentioned this before. This is the main thing you're going to get here. Um, all right. So this is Chapter 2, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the general concepts and um, then uh, demonstrate it live. I see it both Twitch accommodate chatting. Twitch has a chat feature over in Twitch, also in Zoom. So you can use either one. I've got them both on my screen watching now. You can do either one. And Twitch, as far as I know, does not have screen sharing. You can just see my screen. If a student scares a screen, right, they'll have to use Zoom for that, for when a student wants to share their screen, as far as, as, far as I know. That's why I I'm, I'm, can use them both for the time being. Anyway, so uh, here's what we're going to talk about, how buffers work and how the GNU debugger works, and therefore how memory operates on Linux. And this will be the most important part of the course. As I've mentioned before, this project ED202 is the heart of the whole course. When you really understand how buffer overflows work, that's the most essential concept in the course, and everything else we do is a variation on that. And that's true of the whole hacker community. There was this one seminal paper by Aleph Null that explained how buffer overflows worked, and that led to this entire field. Everybody learned how to develop these exploits. Um, so this is the stack-based overflow from Aleph 1 um, way back then. So a buffer is a range of memory where you can store some data. And um, in C, it's an array. All right, so um, I'm using a Debian 10 machine. I'm using a local machine because I don't like to use Google Cloud anymore because they started charging students. And when you do start with just a uh, clean Debian 10 machine, you have to install a couple things. So I put these commands here. They're also in the project, I think, 201. But Build Essential is what gives you uh, compilers. And um, GCC Multilib is what lets you compile 32-bit code on a 64-bit machine which is very handy for us because we're going to study both 32 and 64-bit exploits, and that way you don't need two different machines. So, And GDB is the GNU debugger, which is the main tool we're going to use to examine the memory. So those are things to install on your machine so you can do uh, what I'm doing here. All right. Now, I'm is audio live? Yeah, you should hear it on Twitch. The audio is not coming through Zoom, but it's coming through Twitch. So take your browser that's at this Twitch URL and, uh, and turn up this, the volume there. Let me paste this here. I'm just seeing if people can... That's where you go. That's where you'll see the audio and the video. And other people are able to hear it, right? Yeah, people are hearing it. Okay, good. So... Uh, Yep, there may be some period of adjustment, but I think it's going to work a lot better than Zoom has been working. So, let's play with some exploits. And here's the first one. I'm going to shove this to the side and bring up my Debian machine. And by the way, let me talk a little bit about how I set up my Debian machine. So, I set up a Debian 10 virtual machine of the same type. I just downloaded it as before. It's just sitting here. Now, I could use this desktop. Um, where I sign in here with Debian. I could be typing stuff inside here, but I didn't like doing that. So I just um, get the IP address and connect it with SSH. I like it a lot better because then I can copy and paste and adjust the font size easier and stuff. And I'm used to using cloud machines, so I don't use that console. I use a command line prompt, which is just uh, here. And um, then I just connect with SSH. So let me disconnect and come back just so I show you. All right, so I know the IP address. And uh, good, that's fitting on the screen well enough. All right, so I connect with this SSH command, just SSH Debian at the IP address of my local virtual machine. And now it asks for username and password, so I just give it Debian, because I haven't changed anything. All right, so now I'm in. And now I can, I made a directory called 127, and a subdirectory called chapter 2. And now I have some various programs that we can play with today. So let's take a look at ch12a.c. And I'll make this um, 
bigger. All right, and I'll get rid of the color. Yeah, the color looks pretty good. I think I'll leave it there. All right, so I include the standard library so I can do input output. And here's the only module in my program, main. In C, every module starts with curly braces and ends with curly braces. And so you have to define your variables. So I define an array with five numbers in it. And then I print element number five. And if you know C, you'll see um, what the problem is. In C, if you define an array with five elements, they are numbered 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So array element 5 is not any one of these. So that is kind of a strange thing. I'm printing an element that is beyond the end of the array I've defined. And this is, I, of course, I'm doing this because this demonstrates the fundamental problem with C. C is fundamentally stupid. You can tell it to do something that is obviously stupid, and it will just do it. So it, here it creates, an, when it, it executes this command, it creates an array variable. It points it to a location in memory. It reserves enough room for five integers starting there. And when it goes here and finds this array 5, it just takes the array pointer and moves forward six points to go from 0 to 5. And it does not remember that there's only five things in there. It doesn't check. It translates each line, and if it can translate it, it just keeps going. It does not stop to think about whether you're making a mistake, and therefore people often do make mistakes. So I compiled that thing with, um, let me do it again, it should be up here. There we are. This is the command I'm using to compile it. Uh, let me, okay, ch2a and ch2a, and let me just explain this. Uh, let me make my window a little higher so it's in the, uh, all right, there. This is the, our GCC is the GNU compiler, the standard C compiler. This is the one that will make 32-bit code instead of 64-bit code. The only reason I'm doing 32-bit code is because it's easier for us to understand it first. We'll do 64-bit later. This includes debugging symbols so we can see the source code inside the compiled code, which is handy for debugging, but not generally the case for commercial software. Here's the output file, which is going to be called CH2A. And the input file goes here, ch2a.c. So when I run that, it compiles. Now I can run it with ch2a, and it prints a number. And it's a huge number, minus 744,000. So it printed a strange number that doesn't make any sense. And that is the point here. This is the simplest exploit, if you want to look at it that way. This is an information disclosure exploit. I have read data that I shouldn't be seeing. The only data that was initialized was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but I managed to read data from some part of the system that was not really intended for that purpose. So this is what's called an information disclosure vulnerability. So let's see what's going on here with the GNU debugger. The GDB, you just launch with GDB, and if you launch it and then just give it the name of the program you're debugging, it will have this big screen full of garbage that I don't like very much, so I'm going to quit. The way I like to launch it is at minus Q, which just tells it to be quiet and not print all that garbage. Okay, now I'm in here. Now I can do list. List will show me the source code. Since I compiled it with the minus G switch, I don't have to work from assembly code. I can work from C source code. So it shows me the source code. So I can um, put a breakpoint in here. Let me just check my slides and see my plan was. Uh, I did the list, okay. And now, right, I'm going to put in a breakpoint and run it. And, okay, so let's put in a, a right here is the command that defines this array variable. So I'm going to put a breakpoint here at line 6 with break 6 and then run. Now it has run until it reached this point and then stopped. So I have now created the array and stored five variables in it. And I can now examine it with x slash 8x. Um, I think it's ampersand array. Let me check my, um, yep, ampersand array. What this does is it examines eight hexadecimal words starting at the location of the array variable. So if I look here, this is the actual address where array is stored. It's FFFFD5DC. You always have eight characters of hexadecimal in a 32-bit machine. That's the 32-bit address, because each one of these is 4 bits, 2 of them is a byte, and 8 of them is 4 bytes, which is 32 bits. 
So that's the address. Here's what's in that address. And it's number one, number two, three, four, five. So those are the one, two, three, four, five I defined. And here's the one after number five, which is FFFF D610. And if you interpreted this as an integer, the things that start with FFF will be interpreted as negative numbers. And that's why it printed a number like negative uh, 500,000 or something like that. That's what this number is. So I have read a number here which is storing some internal system value which is not equal to the array. So you can see what I've done. And here's a few, so there are a few commands you saw here. GDB cans, list, shows you source code, run runs the program, break inserts a breakpoint, and X examines the content of memory. In this class, we're going to use GDB a lot. GDB is a huge complicated program. We're only going to use about 10 commands in GDB. It can do much more. But for what we're doing here, uh, 10 commands are enough. And this is the first four of them. So now let's move to the next exploit, which is going to be a denial of service. So that's CH2B. So I'm going to quit out of GDB. I'm going to quit even though I didn't finish running the program. I don't care. And I'm going to nano the text editor I like to use, 2B.C. All right. So this is the same thing. I have a main program. I define an I, an integer, and then an array with five elements. And then I have a loop where I start at 0. I go up to 10,000, going up by 64, printing array sub i. So remember last time I printed array sub 5, which was one element off the end of an array. And now I'm going to print way off the end of an array. I'm just going to go up and up and up and see how far I can go. One thing to notice here is my printf command has format strings, which we're going to play with a lot later. And this format string specifies how to print this information. And x is hexadecimal. So I'm going to print the address of this array element and then the value stored at that array element. That's what the ampersand does. The ampersand gives you the address of this object. And without the ampersand, it prints the data stored in that object. That's what I'm going to print for a whole series of uh, values. So that one I compiled the same way. It's 2B. Oops, got to hit the B. OK. And now I run. And when I run it, it starts up here, printing a couple values. Then it hits a lot of zeros. Then it prints some stuff. And then it crashes. Segmentation fault. So see, it's counting up 4C, 4D, 4E, 4F. And the next one, it can't print. I hit some kind of limit, and I'm reading beyond something. So it's, it apparently got so stupid that even C wouldn't let me do it. And if I want to understand what happened, I use GDB on CH2B. And now I can do list. All right, so there's my program. And let me go back to my slides to see if I got everything. OK, we've seen the denial of service. So now I'm going to put a breakpoint at line 7 before the print. Right. I just have to get it all started because I want to see where it's storing things. So I'm going to put a breakpoint at line 7 and run. So now the program is going. Now I'm down here. OK. Now I'm going to do info proc mappings, another command to know. All right. This lets you see the memory that is used by your program. So I've got some memory segments here used by the CH2B program. Here's some memory segments used by libraries. And if I press Enter, it'll show me some more. This is the one I really care about, the stack. The stack goes from FFDD1000 to FFFE1000, which is 21,000, all in hexadecimal. That's the size of the stack. Now, if I continue the program, so now I'm going to delete the breakpoint and run the program, I think. Let me just check my slides. Um, yep, OK, so I'm going to delete the breakpoints. And then, yes, delete them all, and then run. Continue, rather. It's already running. I want to continue. All right, so now it runs, and I can see where it crashed. It went to FFFDE, FFFDF. And then it couldn't go any further. So I want to remember this, FFFDF. And now I can go up here and see FFFDD, FFFDF is what comes right before FFFE0. 
So it was reading through this region of memory, and when it reached above this value, it crashed. It's not allowed to read off the end of a stack, and this is the way programs work. When you launch a program, the operating system assigns these memory regions to be used by your program, and you are not allowed to go outside them. Your program has to stay within those bounds. And if you try to read or write outside the regions of memory allocated to your program, it will stop and give you an error. So that's what happened here. We have uh, gone out of bounds. All right. So now let's talk about more in general terms about this. Uh, the stack. There's two registers that control the stack, the ESP and the EBP. The ESP is the extended stack pointer, and that points to the top of the stack. When you push, you add another element on the stack and move the ESP to lower numbers, which is higher, and that is how the stack grows. You push things on it, and it grows. You can pop things off it, and then it gets smaller. So if I pop, it will take the data off the stack and put it in EAX or EBX, and then it will move the ESP down. So if I pop to this variable, ESP would stop pointing there and point down here. If I popped another variable, it would move down here. It moves by four bytes at a time because we're using a 32-bit operating system, and the bytes are numbered individually, which is eight bits each, so the addresses always are integral multiples of four, so 10, 14, 18, and the next one would be 1C in hexadecimal. So EBP is the base pointer. Each routine, each subroutine in your program has a certain limited stack range, and that goes from ESP to EBP. EBP is the base of the current stack frame. So uh, that's the game, and you can refer to locations for EBP plus a number, and that will be a location on the stack inside a program, and we're going to see that very soon. And the reason why the stack has this matter of pushing... Um, data on the stack and popping it off in reverse order, last in, first out, is so you can do functions. So when you call a function, you have to stop processing the original routine. You have to save its current state. You have to move into the subroutine. Like if you're running a program and then you hit print, execute a print command, it has to stop doing the current routine, transfer to the print routine, perform the print action, then when the function is done, it has to restore where you left off and resume where you left off. And this step here, where you exit the function and go back to the calling function, is where we're going to take over the machine. Because we can trick it into making a mistake when it tries to resume and make it resume at the wrong address. That's the fundamental technique you use for buffer overflows. All right. Now I'd like to move down one and see if I can figure out which... All right, guess that's working. All right, so um, you have data stored here, like arrays. Then you have the um, old extended base pointer and the return value here, so that when the, when the uh, uh, function is done, you'll use those values to return, and we're going to see them live, so I'm not going to struggle with that thing. All right, so that's the point of this. Now, when you call a function, you might have arguments, and you just push the arguments onto the stack, and then jump in the function, and it looks on the stack to find them, on the stack of the calling routine. So we'll see that go. At the start of a function, there is a prolog, which is what creates that function stack frame. By moving, e it copies the old base pointer onto the stack. It then puts ESP into EBP, so it creates a new starting point at the first available location on the stack that's not used, and then it subtracts some data from ESP to make room on the stack. And we're going to see that uh, live in the uh, debugger in just a few minutes. So that's the game here. Uh, high memory addresses are down here. Low memory addresses are up there. All right. And so here is uh, CH2C. And we're going to look at it in the debugger. So let me do that here. I'm still inside something. I'm going to quit. OK, so nano ch2c.c. All right, so this one has a main function down here, which calls a function called f of 1 and 2. And then it just prints return from the function. That's all it does. So the first command here, it's going to call the function f. Here's the function f. It takes two integer arguments. 
and the function does nothing. It just defines an array with five values for no particular reason and then returns. But we're just going to watch how this operates. So I compile it the same way to C. And when I run it, it just prints return from the function. So that's not very exciting. What's more fun is to debug it. All right, and now I can list, I think 1 to 14 should do. All right, so here's the source code of my function. And I can um, now, I want to set a breakpoint. I think one before I call it and one after I call it was my plan. 10 and 6. Um, yeah, OK, good. So I want to break at line 10 before I call the function. And then I want to break at line 6 when I'm about to try to return from the function. That's when I'd like to see what's going on there. All right, so now I've got my breakpoints. And now I can run it and look at the registers. OK, so I run it. Now I'm in the main function, about to call it. To see what the registers are like, I can do info registers. The registers are little memory locations stored in the processor to keep track of these things. And there's quite a few of them, but the only ones we care about are ESP and EBP. And a little later, we're going to use EIP. The others don't matter to us right now. This is the stack frame of the main function. It goes from 5F0 to 5F8. It's only 8 bytes large, because these functions don't do much. So that is the stack frame of the calling function, 5F0 to 5F8. Now if I continue, it's going to jump into the function. And now I'm inside the function f. Now if I look at the registers, remember this was 5F0 to 5F8. If I look at it now, it's now different. ESP is 5C0 to 5E0. Because I'm in the function, it has created a new stack frame above the other one at lower memory. And it's a little larger because this has uh, some variables and an array in it, a little bit bigger. So it's 32 bytes long, uh, 20 in hexadecimal. So that's the game there. Now let me see what else I wanted to show you here. Um, we've been there. All right, now I can look at the contents of this stack frame. So that's x slash 20x dollars ESP. That is examine 20 bytes or 20 words of hexadecimal and look at the stack. So it starts at ESP. And this is something we are going to do a lot in this course. So you're going to practice this operation. And let me see if I've got my stuff set to display fully on the Twitch. OK. Good. Looks like it's going to fit on the screen all right. So you first you do info registers. And then you can see these values, ESP and EBP. So it's from 5C0 to 5E0. Now you examine the stack frame. This is 5C0. This is 4, 8, and C, 5D. So if it's from 5C0 to 5E0, so that is the stack frame. And you need to get good at doing this process, finding the exact limits of the stack frame. When you see an address here, ESP or EBP, that means you go to that address and the next three bytes to get the entire 32-bit word. So this word goes from 5C0 to 5C3. And it goes, by the way, in this order, because this is a um, little endian. Well, anyway, I'm not going to worry about the order right now. We'll get there when we get to strings. But the point is, this is the first four bytes, the next four, the next four, and the next four. So this is the stack frame. The reason we do this is to notice this. This value right here is the return address. Notice it ends in 1F2. We'll get more to there later. Also notice what's on the stack frame. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. These are the variables we put in that array. So the local variables defined in the source code locally, they go right here on the stack. When you're done with the stack, uh, at the end of the stack frame is the return pointer, which is where you're going to go after this function is over. All right. Uh, now we're going to look at main. So remember this address, 1F2. If I look at the main function, disassemble main, that was 
was 1F2. Um, there is the address 1F2. That is where the return pointer pointed to. And you can see here it is calling the function f. It pushes a 2 on the stack and a 1 on the stack, and then it calls f. And the line of C, these three lines of assembly code make one line of C, and the C was f of 1, 2. That's how you perform a function call. You push the arguments on the stack, and then you call the function. Then when it returns, it will resume here. So the called function figures that out, saves this address, and remembers where to go back to. That's how it works. All right. And so uh, if we disassemble the function, we can look at the prologue that does that. So I'm going to disassemble f. All right, f is pretty small. So here's what f does. Here it is putting 1, 2, 3, and 4 into memory locations on the stack, which is EBP and uh, some kind of numbers adjusting it. And here is the prologue. These three commands are what prepares it to return. It pushes the old extended base pointer onto the stack. It then moves the ESP into EBP, so it starts a new stack frame at the first unused address on the stack, and then it subtracts 20 from the stack to make room for the new stack frame. These three functions in the prolog are what creates a new stack frame. Then it does its calculation based on these locations of the stack pointer, uh, working on the stack, and when it's time to return, it returns down here, and that will resume control at the address that it saved earlier, when it was called. When it was called, that put the uh, EIP on the stack also, and that's what turned into the return pointer. All right. Let me go by slides and make sure I missed anything. Yep, there she had the saved return address on the stack, and that's what goes to this address right after the function call, which we looked at. All right, so now we can do, wait, is that array backwards? Um, no, the array is forwards. If you look at the array in the source code, I set the array equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And you can see on the, uh, in the memory, if I go back to this there, there it is, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the array is not backwards. The thing that's going to be backwards later is strings when we put characters, and that's coming up. But the numbers go right in order. And by the way, they're by default 32-bit integers, since I didn't define them to be anything else. All right, that's good. So we want to do a stack buffer overflow exploit. So here's the function we're going to do for this one, ch2d.c. Let me bring that up. So quit from this. I don't care about finishing running it. ch2d.c. All right. So now this one, I've got a main program down here that calls something called user input and then returns. And the user input function is here. And all it does is define a buffer with enough room for 30 characters and then read data from the input from the command line and then print the buffer. And this is an old-fashioned way of programming and a very dangerous one because the get s function takes data from the user without any limitation to the length of the data. So I only have room for 30 characters, but there's nothing here to tell C to accept only 30 characters, and that's where the vulnerability is. So that's a very simple program, ch2d. Now I'm going to compile that one the same way. And then run it. And by the way, the compiler is going to freak out and say, uh, this gets is not very good. You really shouldn't be using the gets functions. It's dangerous, which it definitely is. Uh, and, you know, this is such an old trick that the C compiler is on to us, but it doesn't stop us from using it. It just warns us. So if I run this, it's waiting for input from me. So if I give it ABC, it prints ABC. But if I give it something longer, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 50 characters, now I get a segmentation fault. So something crashed. Now, this is a denial of service. 
I now have discovered that there is, I have a program which works, but there is some input that causes the program to crash. So that's a denial of service attack. And now the question is, can I do something a little smarter than just making it crash? And the answer, of course, is to um, put it in the, the debugger and we can see what happened here. So if I do a GDB minus Q of that program, which was 2D, and now I do list, say 1 to 14, there's my code. Now um, I call the user input here, then I come down here, and here's when I, where the buffer overflow happens, when I get S. So I think I just want to look at the state of the, uh, of the memory here. I'm going to break at line 7 after I've taken input from the user, but before I've tried to return when it's likely to crash. So if I put a breakpoint there and I run it, now it asks me for my input. I'm going to give it AAAA, for example. That's the, usually what you do because A is easy to spot in hexadecimal. Now it hit the breakpoint and stopped. So let's do info registers. And you'll see that the ESP is 5D0 and the EBP is 5F8. So that's useful information. Now I want to examine the stack, which is x20x ESP. Now all I need to remember EBP is 5F8. So 5F048. This is the end of the stack. That is the stack frame. Now, here are the capital A's I typed in. Capital A is 41. So it's 41, 41, 41, 41. The characters go backwards from right to left inside each word. So those are the four A's I typed in. Then there's other things on the stack. Here's a return pointer, 56, 55, and that looks like a pretty good return pointer. If you noticed last time, that's where code tends to be stored. And you can see here EIP. On this system, the executable code is up here in the area 56, 55. So that's a reasonable number. This is an undamaged return pointer. And that means if I continue, the program will exit normally. It did not crash. It was able to handle the input because it was only four characters long. So now let's put in longer input, run. And um, it's waiting for input, so I'm going to put in the long thing. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. OK. Now I'm going to info registers again. And ESP and EBP, this is of course the fundamental problem with C. ESP and EBP are the same, which means that even though I put in more characters, it did not reserve more room to store them. Other languages like Visual Basic would have expanded the variable to hold the data I put in. But C is too stupid to do that. It will just uh, get me a one gallon bucket. Yes, sir. Put 10 gallons of stuff in it. Yes, sir. It's stupid. It never thinks about whether what you're saying makes any sense. So I have D0 to F8 is what I have. Now if I examine the stack, it's from D0 to F8 here. And you can see that the valid instruction pointers are up here in the range of 56, 55. But now the EIP is 45, 45, 45, 45. The 41s are the A's, then the 42s are the B's, these are the C's, the D's, 45s are the E's. Some of the letters I typed in ended up in the instruction, the saved return pointer here. And this is not a valid memory address. 4545 is not a memory segment that's reserved for the use of this program. The closest thing is where the real instructions are up here at 5655. So if I continue, it's going to try to execute code at this address, 45, 45, 45, 45, and then crash, because that's not a valid memory uh, location for this program. So that's the buffer overflow exploit. And um, all right. And there we go. It's going to crash with 45, 45. And the point is, not only did we make it crash, but it's going to an address that was some of these E's. So we control what address it goes to. And that's how we're going to take over the machine. Some of the data we put in found its way into the instruction pointer. And that shows that we do control it. All right, so here's the GDB commands we covered here. List shows you C source code. 
run runs the program and continue resumes execution after a breakpoint. Break sets a breakpoint. X examines memory. Disassemble shows assembly code. Info registers shows you those registers like ESP and EBP. And info proc mapping shows you the memory map, all the reserved memory segments that your program is using. And I think that's it for the slides. So we can go on to a Kahoot. I'm looking for questions and not seeing any. So that's good. All right. Um, oh, people say the volume is low. Maybe I need to be closer to this. Um, all right. It may take me a little practice to get this thing working well. Anyway, let me bring up the Kahoots, which will be here. And I got to log in. I may be able to find some way to turn up the uh, gain of my mic in this OBS program. So we are here and here, and this is 120, it was right there anyway, 127 chapter 2. This is 127. All right, I'll give it a few more seconds. I guess that's it. Oh, maybe not. Okay. All right. All right. So what language causes the buffer overflows? Kara, I see you saying something about lag. I, I made the length longer for the cahoots. Um, I'm surprised you can tell. They are several seconds behind me, but uh, I don't know how you can tell because the voice should be delayed by the same amount. But anyway, it's C that causes buffer overflows. All right, so what memory section is the simplest to exploit? Oh, thanks for telling me, Kara. That's interesting. Okay, yeah, I know that the Twitch is a few seconds behind. Okay, so um, I did not even know you saw your score locally. Good. That's the stack is the easiest thing. We're going to exploit the heap also, but the stack is simpler to exploit. 
Yeah, the lag is several seconds. All right, in this command, what is the X? Okay, that's the format string. By the way, the lag is pretty funny, but I don't think it lets you cheat. But if it does, feel free to cheat and let me know. Uh, I'm gonna, um, but I think it's okay. All right, what register contains the address of the next instruction? That's the instruction pointer, EIP, in a 32-bit processor. All right, what register is the bottom of the stack frame? All right, that's the EBP, the base pointer. Good. All right, what GDB command shows you the current stack frame's contents? That's it. Examine 20 words at the current stack pointer. Doesn't have to be 20, but the X is the important ingredient. All right. And what GDB command shows you source code? List. That's it. Good. So let's see who won. Costas. That's a real name, I think. All right. That might be a real name, too. And uh, yeah, good. They might all be real names. All right. Good. So I'm going to stop that and stop this recording. All right.